Good morning, everybody. Uh, Steve, thank you. Doug, David, uh, it's a pleasure to participate again this year with hip preservation. So during the meeting, you're going to hear a lot about total hip replacement and what a great operation it is. The question is, what can we do before going on to a total hip replacement, especially in younger patients, and what options do we have? My disclosures, which aren't pertinent. <clears throat> so the question I ask myself almost every clinic day is, is hip preservation possible? Does it even make sense? And is it worth the risk of doing? To answer that, you need to know why hips wear out. And essentially, it's because the anatomy is screwed up. It's usually due to conditions like dysplasia, which is usually the predominant cause, or impingement, which is a close second, and probably the number one cause in male patients. <clears throat> we know that the happy hip is in the middle of this bell-shaped curve between the unstable dysplastic hip and the overly stable impinging hip. And we know that total hip is a great operation. Even in young people, they can resume a lot of crazy activities, as shown here. But knowing about some of the disasters that can occur long term in young patients, is the figure in the middle a more accurate representation of long term uh, success in total hip replacement? When we consider the different options that are available for hip preservation, from hip arthroscopy through osteotomy, FAI-type procedures, and salvage procedures, we should, usually, we should consider the hip replacement to be the option of last resort when nothing else can be done. Well, why not perform hip preservation in everyone? Well, the patient may be too old, and that's kind of a relative term. Is it 40, 50, 80, depending on the procedure? It can be a large procedure, maybe unpredictable at times, with a long rehabilitation. It may require hardware removal down the road. It may make a hip replacement tougher to do later on. Or there may be too much arthritis. We know that it works best in tonus grade zero or one. And you may have a good indication, but the patient may not be ready for it or might not be able to handle it psychologically. But would they be a candidate for arthroscopy, which is less invasive? If a patient is diagnosed with a labral tear, it's important to realize that labral tears rarely occur alone, and it's usually due to some underlying anatomic defect. C 3D CT scans can help to elucidate this. Um, it can uh, show the deformity more clearly and allows us to assess acetabular and femoral version as well. MRIs are indispensable to assess the, the labrum and the articular cartilage and help us to answer the question, how much damage is too much for hip preservation? It's important to have a classification system, such as a tonus classification, zero through three, where zero or one might be suitable for hip preservation, but beware in grades two and three, where there just may be too much arthritis. You may have a fairly good looking x-ray, such as this 60 year old female with mechanical hip pain. Is she a candidate for arthroscopy? But when you look at the MRI scan, you can see that there's delaminating cartilage that's pretty evident, as confirmed at arthroscopy. And in this type of patient, knowing this ahead of time, this might be a better patient uh, for a total hip replacement right off the bat. Sometimes a decision is already made for you, even in a very young patient, such as this 31-year-old with osteoarthritis from acetabular dysplasia, this 14-year-old with Marfan syndrome and protrusio, requiring the entire femoral head to be used as autographed behind the cup, a 14-year-old with juvenile rheumatoid arthritis treated with hip replacement, and post-traumatic osteoarthritis in a 13-year-old, again, treated with a replacement. Sometimes the patient may be a great candidate, such as this 32-year-old female with dysplasia, good joint space um, seen on x-ray, fairly good cartilage on the MRI scan, but she's taking care of two small children. She wants a fast recovery. She feels that she has no time for any follow-up surgery, whether it's hardware removal or a hip replacement someday, and she was very happy with her decision to go on to a total hip replacement instead. What about an age cutoff for these procedures? Well, for PAO, pelvic osteotomy, maybe about 40, maybe in a perfect candidate into the late 40s, same with femoral osteotomy. Hip arthroscopy, because it's less invasive, you might be able to push it into the 60s, 70s, or even 80s, depending on the situation. 
And how old is too old? We know that people are living longer, they're more active in their later years, and if they have hip pain, do we automatically need to go on to a hip replacement or can something else be done? With dysplasia, we know if left untreated, untreated, it can progress rapidly to osteoarthritis, as shown in this 50-year-old female who had fairly good joint space and four years later went on to bone-on-bone -bone changes in both hips. If we can treat uh, dysplasia, the technique that most of us use is the Bernese periacetabular osteotomy designed by Gans, where the socket is mobilized and moved laterally and anteriorly to cover the femoral head. And, and you can see on x-ray here, the socket moved to uh, provide a hor horizontal source seal above the femoral head on both the AP and on the false profile lateral view. And if you're lucky, you get a result such as this. Uh, one of my patients, 15 years out, uh, after a PAO with uh, normal function and no hip pain and full activities. But they don't all work out that well. Uh, the people with most experience, the Swiss group, when they looked at long-term survival, found that at 10 years, maybe up to 90% still had their hip, but it fell to only 30% at 30 years. And they found out that patient selection and the technique for the correction were key factors. And they've been able to construct hazard ratios for survivorship of PAO and the, for the ones that go on to total hip conversion. And they found the biggest risk with six almost six times the risk is tonus osteoarthritis greater than stage one and age over 30 about three times worse. And this was demonstrated also by Rob Truesdale looking at Gans patients with survivorship curves for tonus one, two, and three. And with the rapid fall off, we now know that with grade two or three, they're probably better served with a total hip replacement instead. Does it justify the, sub does it uh, uh, make the subsequent hip replacement any worse? One study by Amantulla showed 23 hips with and without PAO. Both had significant improvement in the Harris hip score, and it was, there was no significant difference. With hip impingement, for whatever the etiology, the final common pathway is damage to the labrum, cartilage, and osteoarthritis if untreated. Till about 2002, the only good way we had to treat this was with an open surgical hip dislocation which is a, a very effective way to do it, but it is a huge operation. And uh, since about 2002, the vast majority of impingement cases are now treated arthroscopically, and it's a technique that has demonstrated great efficacy. And because of this, the number of publications with uh, treating impingement arthroscopically has skyrocketed over the last few years. With arthroscopy, we can assess uh, the central compartment, take care of any damage to the articular cartilage, microfracture if indicated, take care of the labrum, either debridement or refixation, and the offset can be restored pretty reliably in most cases, such as in this 23-year-old. But why do some hip arthroscopy procedures fail? One study showed that in two-thirds of cases, it was because the underlying deformity was not treated, and in, and in one-third, osteoarthritis was already present at the time of arthroscopy. A study by Larson show, <clears throat> in patients with and without arthritis showed a 52% failure rate with arthritis compared to only 12% with no arthritis. This was shown also by Mark Philippon. If he looked at patients that had less than two millimeters of joint space, the risk of going on to hip replacement was 10 times higher. What about doing uh, total hip replacement after arthroscopy? A study that we did looking at 67 total hips matched one to three with controls. We found no difference in the Harris hip score or complications in a minimum two-year follow-up. And then three more recent studies, two of the three also showed that the results were just as good after hip arthroscopy with only one study showing the results slightly worse after hip arthroscopy. With femoral osteotomy with the intertrochanteric for either coxa valga or coxa vera, it can be a very effective technique such as in his 26 year old with coxa valga and excessive femoral antiversion to correct the neck shaft angle and rotation. But we can see as the trochanter, as the uh, 
the hip is rotated in this position, the greater trochanter can sort of block off the canal, making it a little bit more difficult in the future uh, to get a total hip down the canal, a total hip stem down the canal. And if it's a, a more unusual osteotomy, such as this tro subtrochanteric osteotomy, combined with hip fusion, it can be a very difficult hip replacement, requiring a redo osteotomy just to get the stem in. With the technique that we use for derotation osteotomies alone, this is a minimally invasive technique done through small incisions. The femur is cut from the inside, the femur is rotated, and then an intramedullary nail is placed. And in the very few that have required a total hip replacement after this procedure, it's a much easier operation because you don't have the deformity of the upper femur. There's uh, three old studies from the 1990s looking at hip replacement after intertrochanteric osteotomy. Almost all of them showed diminished good or excellent results, higher failure rates, higher complication rates. But keep in mind that techniques for total hip replacement have certainly improved over the years. So this is sort of my uh, scale of degree of difficulty of doing a hip replacement after hip preservation starting with very easy after hip arthroscopy, after a derotation osteotomy, getting a little more complicated with a surgical hip dislocation or a pelvic osteotomy, and then after an intertrochanteric osteotomy, it can be tough, and an arthrodesis with or without femoral osteotomy can be a real bear to do. So in summary, things to consider, it's important to recognize the problem, ask why do hips wear out, and can this hip be saved, or is total hip replacement the only option? What hip preserving options can be used? Is the patient young enough? Is the cartilage okay? Are they mentally suitable to handle the post-operative treatment that's necessary? And will a subsequent hip replacement be less successful in the future? We'll close with this quote by Maurice Mueller, that the best hip replacement has an unknown but certainly finite life, whereas a hip healed after osteotomy will often last a lifetime. Thank you very much.